Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to CDC's Insights uh, event. Uh, the focus today is uh, talking about uh, digital infrastructure in Africa and the role that impact investors play here. Uh, today, we have a panel discussion format. So I will begin with a quick introduction on uh, what CDC has been doing in digital infrastructure in, in Africa. And then I'll introduce you to our panel and we'll have uh, hopefully a good discussion. Um, I'm Abhinav Sinha. I uh, head uh, equity investments at CDC in technologies and telecommunications. Uh, CDC has been quite active in the digital infrastructure space. Uh, we have uh, maybe about a $600 million uh, portfolio. Uh, and uh, the reason we've, we've, quite focused, uh, we've been quite focused in this space is uh, twofold. Right? First, uh, we've really uh, figured uh, out that investment in digital infrastructure is a bit of a force multiplier. So not only do you improve connectivity, you also uh, get uh, you know, enhanced financial inclusion, you get better digital, uh, digital uh, education, you get better access to healthcare, e-governance, and, and so on. It's very transformative uh, for society. Um, and then as we put numbers behind it, we found that typically a 10% increase in connectivity often leads to up to a 1.4% boost uh, to the GDP of a country. And we've seen this in country after country in, in DRC, in Tanzania, and so on. Um, and as a result, over the last few years, we've invested very heavily in spaces such as fiber, uh, data centers, uh, building mobile networks, uh, and, and looking at cloud services. Um, and uh, what, what we found though is that even though there has been tremendous investment over the last few years, there is still a lot to do. Uh, there is, uh, you know, a lot of their technology changes coming, there are countries which are still significantly underpenetrated, the populations without uh, connectivity and, and internet. Uh, and so uh, what we have today for, for you is a discussion around this with some of the leading lights in the ICT industry in Africa. Um, so let me just uh, uh, you know, introduce uh, all of you to the panelists. We have uh, with us uh, Alex. Alex is Director of uh, Network Investments uh, Emerging Markets for Facebook. Uh, and Alex is a uh, you know, very experienced investor in the digital infrastructure space. Uh, previously, she was Managing Director with uh, ECP. Um, then we have Stephen. Stephen is the CEO of, is the CEO of Paradigm. He runs uh, Tower Network in Tanzania. And previously, he used to head uh, American Towers for the uh, for Africa and for the broader EMEA region and has seen some of the new trends in telecom towers uh, over the last few years in Africa. Uh, we then have Guy. Guy is the chairperson for uh, Accelerate. He is a veteran in the data center industry and has a long association with Traco, which is now the largest data center company in, in Africa. Uh, and Guy is also quite experienced in, in Europe and in multiple other countries uh, in, in the data center space. Uh, and then finally, we have Nick, uh, Nick Rudnick. Nick is the CEO of uh, Liquid Intelligent Technologies. Uh, Liquid is the largest data infrastructure company in Africa. And Nick uh, is, uh, has been uh, leading that effort for over two decades. Um, so maybe we can start with, uh, with some of the discussions with the panelists. Let me, let me start with, uh, with maybe with, with you, Nick. Um, you know, and I guess the, 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 the first question I want to ask you is, what are the key trends in, in connectivity and digital infrastructure in Africa that, that you see over the next uh, maybe five years? Well, you know, I think a lot has been uh, accomplished already in terms of long haul fiber, uh, getting uh, fiber and connectivity into towns and cities, you know, can connecting up businesses. Um, but I think the trend going forward um, really is going to be led over the next five years by uh, 5G. And it's not just the, um, the rollout of 5G, but it is going to be the fiber that is needed uh, to connect uh, those uh, 5G cells. I mean, 5G is effectively a small cell, high capacity, but it's going to need a lot more fiber, fiber to the tower, fiber to the building, 
um, fiber to the curb in order to give adequate 5G coverage. And I think on the back of that fiber uh, expansion, uh, we will see more and more people uh, becoming connected uh, to fiber uh, in their homes uh, and elsewhere. Um, you know, quite a shocking statistic that um, I've seen just over the last uh, week from a research agency saying that across Africa, there's only 28 million homes that are connected to very fast broadband, whether by fiber or wirelessly, um, only 28 million uh, homes are connected. Um, you know, obviously, it's a, you know, a tiny fraction of the population. And I think for the economics to work and to connect uh, more people uh, in their homes to high-speed broadband, um, it needs a, a driver, the driver, you know, 5G, but uh, on the back of that, uh, a lot more people being connected uh, to, to the internet with uh, high-speed uh, connections. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. And uh, Nick, as you think of these new trends, I mean, what do you think will drive uh, the biggest impact on development? Well, I think the, the, the development will be led by uh, entrepreneurs across the continent who are becoming uh, you know, more uh, digitally uh, aligned, who are uh, utilizing technology, who are developing uh, local software solutions, um, who are developing applications that have got local re uh, relevance. So I think in terms of, of employment and uh, economic development, um, you know, we like in the industry always to believe that just connecting uh, people to, uh, you know, to, to high speed connectivity is, is, is the answer and the end of it. But really the, the main uh, economic uh, benefit and the main driver of, of jobs and uh, growth and impact on the economy will in fact be these uh, digital workers, the new digital workforce, uh, developing all of these uh, solutions, uh, you know, within Africa. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, let me let me direct a question to to Stephen. Um, Stephen, you you've seen the the tower uh, companies um, and, and different models uh, come through in there. Um, let me place the same question to you. And where, what are some of the new trends you're seeing in, in that part of the digital infrastructure? Uh, and maybe if you can also give your thoughts around what will drive development the most within that space. I think you've seen, a, you've seen an explosion in, in towers and, and infrastructure supporting wireless networks across Africa. Um, and, and if you stand back and you look at the characteristics that have driven that growth, it, it's, those characteristics are still there today. You've seen a you know, very strong demand for the products. You've seen a very young population. You've seen networks, actually network access, although the disposable income in Africa is very low, network access costs are, are, are low. And, and as you see, you know, the price of handsets decreasing, you see that demand continually growing for, um, for, for new access to the internet if the, price put, if the price point is right. So I think from, from what we see, there's been an awful lot done by, you know, by companies in terms of investment in fiber, soft sea cable, connectivity, towers, infrastructure. But the economics of that has always followed um, very much the, the urban areas. And... And now I saw was reading some stats the other day where you know the, you've got somewhere around uh, forty four percent of the African population that are in urban areas and that are getting some service now, but there's still a big balance in rural areas that are not. So I think to to me, you know, you're going to see growth for sure in 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 data centers, maybe pan African data centers, and there's some of the panel that are much better qualified to answer that than me, but. But I can see that if regulation allows and, uh, and there's not the sort of restrictions on keeping data within one country, you can see the, the opportunity there. Um, I have to say, from my experience in working with mobile operators, 5G is still some of the way off. For sure, we're seeing increased fiber to towers, not just in urban areas, but, but also sort of semi-urban, which reflects the fact that there's an awful lot of data capacity required and backhaul required to service this, this infrastructure. But most of the operators seem pretty focused at the moment, at least, 
on a, on 4G solutions. Um, and I think, so, 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 I mean, to, to sort of summarize in a nutshell, I think if you look at the last five years or next five years, you kind of take some pretty good insight from the, from the last five years, with the exception possibly being that you, there's, to, to me, there's a need to move beyond the, the urban centers and start finding solutions which enable these products to be utilized um, by, by people in more rural areas. And, and, and that in itself, I think, to answer the second part of your question, Abano, is where, where do you get the most you know, um, bang for your buck if you're investing in, in, and wanted to have uh, impact economics? Well, to me, it, it's really focusing more on, on that area because there you have the ability to bring people into the digital, um, into the digital arena that haven't been part of it before, and groups which have been excluded before. You know, often often women in 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 that society, um, and and that's really very exciting, frankly. Thanks so much, Stephen. I mean, uh, rural area expansion, just the broader inclusion. I mean, that that sounds like uh, probably the what the next five years should look like. So good to hear that. Um, let me rope in uh, Guy at, at this point. Uh, Guy, you, you're, you've seen the data center industry uh, develop over the last decade. Um, and we've, over the last few years, we've had a real expansion in uh, hyperscale capacities, uh, initially in South Africa and maybe Kenya, and now increasingly in Nigeria and, and other parts. Uh, would love to get a, a bit of a stare from you on where uh, where do you see uh, you know these these trends heading uh, towards over the next five years? And again, the, the question I'm asking all panelists: uh, if you try to link it to development, I mean, uh, how do you see that uh, linkage? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, just to correct the um, uh, my 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 day job. I mean, I've, I'm chairman of Accelerate in Russia and chairman of IX Africa data centers in Kenya, which is kind of East Africa's first hyperscaler. So yeah, uh, I've been in the data center industry for far, far too long. I think I started off in 1998 trying to raise money, raised uh, my first round in 99 for a pan-European rollout, which we then floated in 2006, sold off. And then I got phoned up by Tim Parsonson, who was starting up a data center company in South Africa, which uh, sounded fun. So we uh, we sort of went on that journey, and um, and then after that, ended up doing work with the European Bank, looking at infrastructure projects in Russia. So similar focus, different continent, um, and I've been in in the Russian business for about eleven years now, something like that. And uh, and the Kenya project started sort of seeing the light around two thousand ten, but actually didn't get funded until um, until about a year ago. So and it's charging ahead at the moment. The um, I think, as Nick said, that the you know, data centers are, are a driver. This this whole in, internet infrastructure thing in Africa is, is 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 vitally important. I don't, even though, as Stephen said, only forty four percent of people live in cities. Um, if we can get them all hooked up, that's better than nothing. Let's not focus on the impossible. Let's let's get the, the possible done first, and uh, and that that's really key. We talk about uh, nomad workers. You know, I've got a son who's uh, between degree and master's in computer science at the moment. So, you know, he's sitting in Barcelona skateboarding while he does uh, an IT job, uh, you know, being paid a salary while he waits to get his master's. So, you know, and yet he's UK based normally. So one could imagine tens of thousands of nomadic workers wandering around the world. But obviously, if the broadband's rubbish in that city, then they won't come. And that is, uh, you know, that, that's foreign income coming to, to those countries. But more importantly, Data center in a country is a massive economic driver. Um, some estimates, I think Tim was looking at this uh, for his projects, both in Nigeria and obviously previously at South Africa, that you know, for every dollar invested in a data center, there's another hundred dollars invested in other bits of the digital economy. So it's it's a massive thing. Is data center the driver? I don't know, but at least when people start investing in heavily in data centers in a country, it means something's going right. Now that could be data sovereignty, whereby the big players need to be in that country. You know, we've seen Microsoft announcing $2 billion investment in Greece. Google's going into Poland with a $3 billion investment. These are not big countries economically. Uh, and this has obviously happened in South Africa already. 
It's inevitable in Kenya and Nigeria, but it's probably going to follow through in many other countries. So it's a really exciting time, I think, in this whole internet infrastructure um, world. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Guy. I mean, the one dollar in data center leading to about 100 in the digital economy. It's a fascinating, fascinating fact. Uh, you know, at, at CDC, we've been looking at it uh, as well. So it's great to hear uh, those sorts of uh, numbers. Um, look, let, let me just uh, pull in Alex. Uh, uh, Alex, you've uh, had, or Facebook in general has had big ambitions for the continent. Uh, and we've, uh, we've seen some uh, big investments done in, uh, in fact, across the digital infrastructure chain. Uh, it would be great if you can share from a OTT perspective of how you look at digital infrastructure uh, and, uh, and the linkage to, to development again. Sure, um, I'll pick up on a couple of the themes that my colleagues have already mentioned, uh, including Nick, who talked about 5G. I mean, I think the reality is, even though um, more than 50% of the continent right now is 4G covered, actual usage is significantly less. So I think we are a ways away from 5G. That being said, I think Nick is correct that that is going to drive a lot of uh, the development that needs to take place. Data usage is absolutely going up. We saw that during COVID. Um, our pool is going down and OpEx is flat. So that means that what I see coming out of both 4G adoption and 5G adoption is the need for infrastructure sharing. And that's really where we have focused on as Facebook is trying to promote and partner with various partners in the ecosystem in order to promote open access and infrastructure sharing. Um, if you think about what 5G requires in terms of the number of cells that are required on that, that means you're going to need to have three to time three to 10 times the number of towers, right, in order to cover that. Uh, you're also going to have to have significantly more uh, backhaul connectivity. So even though we've made progress, we are a ways away from being really able to support that. And, you know, when, what we look at as Facebook is we want to ensure that we're empowering communities, right, by uh, and, and preventing the digital divide here. Uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So in, in order to promote that, in order to ensure that um, we can, in fact, support and reduce digital, uh, the digital divide, we really need to promote infrastructure sharing, including uh, in the backhaul space, whether it's network as a service in terms of connecting rural communities, as Stephen mentioned, or in terms of 5G getting more um, spectrum sharing, right? So not just talking about passive co-location, which is really what's been done to date, but really thinking about policy changes that will promote active sharing as well, because that's going to be required to really drive 5G. So across the internet ecosystem, we see infrastructure sharing and promoting that is critical to uh, really supporting development. Alex, thank you so much. And, and let me pick on the point uh, around infrastructure sharing and, and sort of a broader point of, uh, you know, regulations and how important that is for uh, developing digital infrastructure uh, across the continent. Uh, what has been your own experience around, uh, you know, key regulatory interventions required to, to uh, help this uh, sector flourish? I think it's a it's a mixed bag. Uh, there's definitely a lot of progress that is being made, but if when you look at um, what are some of the reasons um, that is, that's preventing infrastructure sharing, some of them are in fact policy uh, issues. Uh, the rural areas that are not connected, there's over 260 million people in Africa who are still not connected today. Most of those are in rural areas. The economics of supporting rural connectivity are not ideal. And so the only way to really promote that is through um, business models such as network as a service and other infrastructure sharing types. That requires policy intervention to encourage uh, MNOs and other infrastructure players in the ecosystem to do that effectively. So we see that happening in some countries, but I think there's a ways to go there. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, in terms of 5G, uh, frankly speaking, the economics just do not support three to 10 times the amount of towers, right? Given the cost that is required, it does not make sense for MNOs to build all of that infrastructure themselves that, that's going to be required, right? So um, we are going to need to have more than just co-location that's being promoted, but we're also going to need to have active 
um, we're also going to need to promote active sharing in terms of spectrum as well. And Africa is a bit behind in terms of the developments, the policy developments around that. You know, finally, beyond just uh, the, the economics of spectrum sharing or co-location, I think we also need to think about um, trade and other such policy interventions that are also required. Um, capital, uh, we need to bring investors to support the amount of the billions of dollars that are required to support this, right? How are you going to bring impact investors such as yourself or investors um, such, as, such as us, given some of the trade restrictions, currency, repatriation, et cetera, um, constraints that exist. So I think there are policy solutions, both in terms of telecom, as well as in the trade business area that can help to support increased uh, development and impact investors here. Thanks, Alex. And, uh, you know, I, 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 let me also just uh, take the same point and ask Stephen around uh, this uh, sharing of infrastructure uh, and how relevant it is uh, in the tower co, uh, in the tower codes that, that he's been seeing. Uh, but also what else can be done to, to make some of these rural access, which he spoke about, uh, feasible? Firstly, I totally agree with Alex. I think it's, it's, um, it's inevitable that's where the business model has to go because you can only get so far with sharing co-location, you know, through co-location sharing. Um, the reality is, as you, as you move down to some of these 5G networks, from a tower code perspective, and I'm, I can't speak for other businesses, but from a tower code perspective, it's actually quite hard to get uh, an economic model to work where you're trying to support a small cell, where it's more difficult to to, to um, where it's more difficult to share, where the uh, the radius of the population you're covering is much is much smaller. So you have to look at more innovative models, like what else can you use the fibre to to do? And we've used, you know, in previously in my in, in my previous company, we've looked at examples where, you know, you can partner, you can put fibre down for for either for uh, connectivity for to households, rural broadband, et cetera. So it becomes multi-user user and you, or, or multi-product. And I think it's the same whether you can tie it to small cells that you know, have a cell advertising space or whatever. Just back to your, to your rural example, though, I think you, you are seeing more there. You, know, you have seen a movement into sort of where people are pushing the boundaries. They're looking at open round solutions, but but increasingly look at, at, at solutions which, which are linked to, to VSAT, so the, the backhaul is less of a, an issue. And, you know, at the moment, technology doesn't really quite support that. It's getting much better than it was, but still, you know, you, you'll get a 2G and 3G, maybe you might get 4G services. It doesn't really support the large, um, the large data demand that's required for, 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 for what you're trying to achieve. But it would feel to me that that's very much a way that... that, that commerce and industry needs to go. You've got this, you know, it's brilliant. The brilliant thing about, uh, about commerce is it, it normally finds a solution, a commercial solution to a problem. And there is a problem at the moment. There's big groups of people that are underserved, that if you can bring them th that connectivity, well, then it will be a, a huge transformational um, enabler to them. And therefore that's, the, you know, I think that's the challenge. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Stephen. Um, let, let me just, uh, you know, bring Nick in. I, I think, Nick, you, you started the debate uh, by speaking about 5G. And obviously, Liquid has been doing some quite innovative things in, for instance, Kinshasa and, and you know, using different technologies to, to increase bandwidth availability. Uh, could you probably share with, with us what are some of the other technical innovations you're seeing? Um, and, you know, and, and we, we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, I think from a, a technical point of view, I mean, the the fiber is is there in many cases. It continues to be it continues to roll out, um, but I think the the main challenge ahead of us is to uh, increase from that twenty eight million uh, of people connected to fast internet to uh, closing the gap on that middle mile uh, and then the last mile. Um, you know, if we are going to start getting the majority of the African continent uh, connected uh, at, uh, at speeds and at a price point that they can afford. Um, we really need to be able to deliver that middle mile and last mile um, you know, at an economic uh, price point. And you know, I think part of that goes back into uh, the earlier discussion about uh, infrastructure sharing. 
And you know, Africa has historically been terrible at infrastructure sharing. Um, you know, the, the mobile operators uh, have always seen infrastructure as a competitive advantage um, because when they started, the infrastructure wasn't there. And you know, still up until now, um, you know, it, it's almost built into the their DNA that uh, infrastructure is some kind of competitive uh, advantage. Uh, at the same time, you've got the uh, historical uh, PTTs that um, in some instances have been privatized or in, in, in other instances, if not privatized, have been commercialized, whose uh, main objective in life seems to be to, in many instances, to try and um, uh, reinstate the uh, monopolies which they previously uh, enjoyed. And you know, I think that combination of, of factors has meant that um, you know, Africa has been very bad at infrastructure sharing. And you know, more recently, uh, we've seen uh, institutions uh, and companies uh, coming in and funding the government to build uh, connectivity, which I think is an enormously inefficient way uh, of building infrastructure and making it available. The idea is that it can be shared but invariably that government infrastructure isn't shared uh, very well. And I think that you know, a better intervention by the government would be to take that funding and buy capacity from the private carrier neutral players who can then build the networks uh, up and you know, share them with everyone. So you know, I, I think in terms of technologies and business models, you know, that, that really is the way we need to go if we're going to have the funding and the capital to close the, the middle and the last mile. Oh, thanks so much, Nick. Um, you know, and, uh, look at this stage. Let, let me just bring Guy in. Uh, uh, and uh, look, there's a QA uh, panel, and we're getting a bunch of questions. And I thought after a guy spoke uh, about his data center, we had a very interesting question on saying, look, uh, as critical as data center is, or data centers are, uh, they're also, you know, big guzzlers of energy. And how how do you think through greening of data centers, and and how feasible is that at, at this stage of maturity in I think there's Africa? <clears throat> there's two factors here. It really depends on which country you're in. You know, if you're in Kenya, you've got ninety percent renewable energy now from geothermal, hydro, wind power. So that's that's you know, it's a, it's a real great example. It's far ahead of many European countries except perhaps Switzerland and Sweden or somewhere like that. Um, so, but generally it is an issue. Um, however, if you put, uh, you know, 100 computers in one room and you look after them properly, that's a lot better than having 100 computers under various people's desks. You know, you think, you know, 100 private cars versus 100 people in a bus or a train, uh, or, you know, 100 people in a plane crossing the Atlantic versus 100 private jets individually crossing the Atlantic. Um, uh, so, you know, there are massive economies of scale in terms of data center and you know as, as Alex touched on you know sharing infrastructure the data center is the original uh, you know telecoms infrastructure sharing service it's a mutualization of uh, services inside a building where people co-locate in other words they just bring their computers but somebody else looks after them and they share that service amongst you know 100 200 300 different people the crystallization of that can be an internet exchange where lots of different networks connect and share share their networks with each other, uh, and that's a that's a beautiful example of uh, of infrastructure sharing. I think Nick touched on the issue of um, full deregulation being necessary for proper infrastructure sharing to happen, because otherwise it's just, just you know it's just monopolies. But on the green side, uh, data centers are brand new technology, so they are as green as they possibly can be. Uh, they're right at the, the forefront. They're not like big aluminium smelters where there's loads of economies to be made. Uh, you know, the technology is evolving every month of the year at the moment in, in cooling systems, in more efficient, uh, you know, site positioning of, of servers, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot going on in that, uh, in that space today. Well, thanks so much, guys. So I, I guess it's an important uh, point that one has to see the energy consumption of data centers versus uh, sort of the benchmark of, of what uh, energy needs to be consumed for that computing um, and versus just saying these are big customers. Uh, yeah, so that's the PUE. So I mean, that, that's, that's power usage efficiency. And, 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 and what we see these days is if you sign a large contract with a Microsoft or you know, our friends at Facebook here or 
whatever, there will be in the contract some motivational clauses pushing you to be more efficient in your energy usage. So that's a new thing that's crept in in the last five years, where the customer, bigger customer is demanding that your data center be as efficient as possible. Right. Well, thanks so much, Guy. Um, look, you, you mentioned Facebook. So, you know, let, let me get Alex in at this point. Uh, Alex, you, you've spoken about uh, empowering communities, uh, right? And I think a big, a uh, big part of digital infrastructure is how how it facilitates that, um, and how uh, democratic almost it is at at, at including people. Uh, would you like to share some examples of of what you've seen and and what uh, you've been working on uh, uh, along this uh, area? Sure. Um, we we do everything with partners. So I'm going to highlight a few of the partners that we've worked with. Um, one of, example is an investment that we made in, in Uganda, where we were working with a, a local wholesale operator, uh, BCS and, uh, and Airtel. Uh, and through the backhaul that we um, invested there, we, we supported laying out backhaul there. They were able to not only connect um, more than 5 million people in uh, the Uganda region, but also uh, in South um, Sudan. And so the investment that we made in Uganda ultimately had an uh, impact across um, not just that region, but or not just that country, but in the broader region. Uh, similarly, we've made investments in Nigeria. Um, and in fact, we've built more than 10,000 kilometers of fiber around uh, emerging markets to date uh, through partners uh, such as BCS uh, uh, in, in Nigeria was main one. Uh, in our education partnership, we were able to use that backhaul that we um, helped to support with main one to actually connect a number of universities and schools in Nigeria. So the impact can be quite significant. Uh, I think for us, what we want to do is to be able to empower and enable the partners, the local partners, uh, to really um, create a better ecosystem. Um, Guy talked about data centers, and um, we very much believe that there is a lot of opportunity in carry neutral uh, colos, et cetera. Um, today, 90% of the African population is subsisting on only 10% of data center usage because there are very few metros that actually have uh, real carry neutral colos location. So we see that as an area where um, there's going to be a lot more investment opportunities and we hope to partner with people uh, such as the, the guys of the world and, and, and others to, to support that. And what content localization does and ultimately what edge computing does is it does have a major impact on uh, reducing cost, right? Um, the more content is local, uh, the more the actual internet costs are, right? Today, Africa is about four times um, the, the internet costs or about data usage costs about four times that of the global uh, benchmarks. And if we can support colo CARIC neutral co-locations and other data center usage, we can dramatically reduce the internet usage costs. And that has a multiplier effect, as you were talking about at the beginning of the hour have and off, right? Um, if you right. reduce the cost for data, that means remote learning is possible. That means remote work is possible. That means um, people can look for jobs. That means people can um, provide service jobs, et cetera. And the reality today is that more than 600 million people in Africa have coverage, but are actually not using the internet. So we also need to go beyond just talking about just the infrastructure itself and talking about affordability. And so that's why I think that infrastructure sharing and things such as uh, carry neutral co-locations, uh, tower infrastructure, et cetera, is so important because it fundamentally addresses the affordability barrier that's preventing the vast majority of Africans from getting connected today. It's not just a coverage game. It's not just about access. It's actually also about affordability. It's about devices. Uh, we can talk 4G and 5G, but people don't have devices for 4G or 5G, right? So we're going to have to figure out affordability to actually enable the development impact that we all care about on this call. Right. Well, thanks so much, um, Alex. I mean, affordability, uh, like you mentioned, is key, and a lot of it comes from sharing of infrastructure and, and you know, hopefully there's some technical innovation as well, which, which drives that. Uh, but let me shift the debate to a point which Nick had mentioned uh, at the start of the call uh, around how entrepreneurship is getting a, a fillip with, with uh, the additional digital infrastructure and how it's creating locally relevant businesses. Uh, so maybe Nick, if, if you can talk us a bit more through uh, 
uh, through that model of economic development that that you've you've seen, um, that would be great. Yeah, well, I think you know what we are starting to see um, develop um, across Africa is the creation of uh, digital hubs, um, areas where the connectivity is there, where it's affordable, where you've got a concentration of of entrepreneurs and an enabling economic environment that you know permits a digital hub to be formed where people are doing software development, they are creating applications for local use. Um, it's being applied in a number of different areas, whether it's industrial or agriculture, because even those people are digital workers once they are you know, making use of these you know, digital capabilities. And you know, we've certainly seen um, digital hub um, uh, in Nairobi, and I think we are, you know, we're seeing a digital hub um, in, in South Africa. Um, and, you know, the West Africa, you know, I think the jury is still out. Um, it should be Lagos, but I'm not sure it is yet. Um, and, but I, I think we will continue to build up these hubs, uh, not only in, you know, those three countries, but uh, in other countries as um, you know they create an enabling environment and they get you know these collections of entrepreneurs uh, working in a way that you know creates wealth and industry around digitalization and you know I think that you know the data centers will also follow uh, where those digital hubs are so the digital hubs means data centers arrive you know more connectivity and I think really that is going to be the, the the driver of you know job and wealth creation around digital development uh, on the continent and and the, how i mean how do you predict which is the next digital hub or if you look at the digital hubs which are there what are the characteristics which allow uh, this to develop well i think it is um you know a free market environment um such as you see uh, in kenya um, it is a, uh, a entrepreneurial and technology orientated culture that develops. And, you know, if you look at the number of uh, internet hubs and, um, you know, the whole um, tech industry that has uh, arisen in Kenya through, through entrepreneurs, and it's not driven by the big companies, you know, it's, it's, it's driven from, you know, graduates from the universities. Um, I think that's what creates um, the digital hub. Um, and even in terms of cloud services, I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, in terms of um, revenues being generated from, 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 from cloud, in Kenya, it is the startups that are actually making more use of the cloud than we're seeing some of the big industry uh, doing. So, you know, I, I think it is, uh, it, in a way, what we've seen so far is it's almost driven by the entrepreneurs rather than adoption by, you know, the big corporate world. Um, and I think that's also why you've, you've seen it in, in South Africa. Um, you know, also this big sense of uh, entrepreneurship around uh, technology. Um, and, you know, I think you are starting to see that developing in a number of other African countries. And, um, you know, some of them have still got some catching up to do. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, the, the seeds are there and they're starting to grow. Right. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Nick. Look, I, I'd say know. I just cut in and say on, 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 on what Nick's saying on sort of digital hubs. Um, if I look at the parallel, what I'm doing in Russia, which is which is evolving a bit faster, but, you know, it's still playing catch up in infrastructure with 11 time zones. There are 12 cities with more than a million population in Russia, but there isn't much data center in apart from two cities. If you look at the US, the US has got less than 12. It's got about 10 cities of over a million population. And yet it's got 20, 40 megawatt data centers in cities with 400,000 population. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, it's roughly 45 to 50 cities with over a million population. So in theory, medium term, you should have about 20 megawatts in each of those. So if you do a bit of maths, and you assume that you invest, say, $8 million a megawatt in each of those cities, that's a very, very big number for Africa to catch up, sub-Saharan Africa. But it's an inevitability that at some point that capacity in some shape or form will be in those, in those cities. 
Well, thanks so much, Guy. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, you know, something you'd mentioned earlier in the call uh, was around the fact that uh, Africa is actually a very uh, urban continent as well, you know, and maybe about 44% of Africa lives in cities. And so there is a model of growth that says, let's target the cities where it's relatively easier. And to, to Nick's point right earlier, uh, why should only 25 million people have high-speed internet? Maybe that entire 44% first gets very high-speed internet. So that's one model of growth. I mean, the other is to say, look, let's bridge the digital divide with the rural. And then how do we think of infrastructure sharing and new models so that we can access rural? Um, and I guess the, uh, it's more a, a common than a question, Guy. I mean, how, how do you think of these two models? I and mean, can the two subsist? Should one lead or the other? I think, I, I, I mean, the whole rural thing is, is, is very tricky, but it's, 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 a, it's a big problem globally so many many very clever people are looking at um rural access from idaho to siberia to to, to rural kenya so you know somebody's going to come up with some good ideas at the moment if you look at something like i don't know starlink or uh, the aws staff or what was project loon um it comes back to what alex said you know they may have connectivity but can they afford it because if if starlink comes in at 200 dollars a month that's great, but nobody's going to use it in, in, in rural Africa. So uh, in, it's cheaper at the moment technologically to service the cities, that's clear. Uh, you can staple gun a load of fiber to, to blocks of flats, and, and that's what a lot of people do in many places around the world. So you can get, get very high-speed internet to people in urban areas. Getting out to the, to the, to the, to the getting out to suburban and the country areas, that's, that's a whole other challenge, I think, and I'd probably ask people like Stephen and Nick, you know, a lot more about it than I do. Yeah, maybe well, Stephen. I have or... enough. Sorry. I, I was just going to say that I, I think it's not really an or, it's an and, right? And. You, you need to have both the metro served and private equity funds and other investors uh, are going to go to the metros, of course, but we need people like CDC. We need other investors, other impact investors focusing on bridging that divide so that the rural areas and other underconnected communities are not left behind. So I don't think it's or, I think it's both. Uh, we, we, need, we need both types of investors at the table to ensure that this happens. I agree, Alex. Um, you know, I think it is and. Um, and I, I, I guess I had a question for Stephen on that. So uh, whether he's seen models uh, around rural connectivity on, on the tower side, uh, and, you know, and, uh, and all, all the, uh, he had mentioned a few things, open RAN and, and, and so on, and whether it's working in, in parts of Africa. I think, I think it is in a more, um, well, that, is it working? I, I don't think it's quite there yet. I don't think there's very many examples. What you are seeing in, you know, generally is movements by telecoms regulators to try and encourage mobile operators to share in rural areas because there's a, there's a recognition that, it, you know, it doesn't work unless you're sharing infrastructure and the cost of that infrastructure is being shared. And to a degree, you can see that that that, that absolutely does reduce the cost and make the economic the economic argument or the commercial argument much much better i do think there's an awful i mean clearly there's an awful way a long way to go and uh, to, to me until you you know you do have a problem with with the regulation and spectrum you, you know mobile operators pay pay a lot of money for spectrum and and then someone comes along and tells them that they've got to to share that and that doesn't always go down very well so I think there's a it's it, it's there's a sort of a policy thing that needs to happen. But if you can take forward the concept, if you say, well, okay, you know, go back to if you sort of go back and 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 try and get back to before the history came along of auctions and network sharing and and this like uh, sorry auction spectrums and and and, and etc. And go back to say, well, if you could have an open RAN network, how would that do? You can see that those those models are, are clearly what's going to drive. Um, accessibility to to users in rural or rural networks, um, and I'm I'm sure you know there are some examples of where that has been happening. If you looked in South Africa, they they had a um, a, a, a policy to try and to do something similar, and I'm sure you'll see a push from regulators in in that way. All right. Well, thanks, Stephen. Um, look, uh, let me change direction and, and introduce uh, the topic of of talent per se. I think. As we, when we discuss the broader technology stack, uh, 
the, the quality of talent becomes quite critical. Um, and I was wondering if in the panel, uh, what is your view on availability of talent in the digital infrastructure space? And is that a constraint? And how do, does one think of developing it? Uh, and I know Nick, you've, you've done a bit of thinking around this. So maybe we can start, well, start with you. I think that there's a lot of enthusiasm um, across young people uh, in, in Africa and in universities and, and in schools to uh, get digital skills. And I, you know, I think it's increasing, um, you know, not to the extent that uh, we probably needed to increase, but, you know, I think that there's a, no, a number of initiatives that are helping with that. I mean, there's these um, uh, digital hubs and, you know, like Nairobi Garage and, and other hubs that have been set up to you know, help entrepreneurs, but also to bring in uh, new skills. Um, and you know, there's there's a lot of online learning that is that is now available. I mean, we've put together a, a portal called the Century Twenty One Skills, which is um, all about um, enabling people to uh, uh, do digital learning and get certifications, um, which allows them to to advance. So, I mean, certainly there's enormous potential there. I mean, if you look at the proportion of the African population that, you know, is under 20, um, and you look at the uh, demographics of the future, I mean, you know, Africa is probably the only continent that over the next 20, 30 years will have the majority of its population, you know, being under you know, 30 years old. So the, you know, the, the potential is, is huge. Um, and, you know, I think it is partly on us as an industry to start um, enabling uh, people to pick up those skills. And I think it is happening, um, at, and certainly in some countries faster than others. But, um, you know, that's something that we, you know, we need to accelerate. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, Alex, I mean, what would be your view on, on talent? Uh, you've seen this uh, industry for a long time um, in Africa. I think Africa has tons of talent that's untapped. I think it's the industry that needs to tap the talent. Um, it's definitely there. Uh, Facebook is committed and really believes that the talent is there. Hence, we're opening another office in Africa. We're opening a Lagos office um, and it's going to have software developers and other engineers there as, as well. So we're really proud of the fact that, um, you know, we're really making a commitment to Africa in that way. Um, you know, we were talking about Open RAN earlier. One of the reasons why Open RAN is also exciting to us, and we've really invested in that uh, through the uh, technology tip, technology and infrastructure project that Facebook has been funding for, for many years now. And one of the reasons why we're really excited about it is because of the entrepreneurship aspect that that creates, right? Um, it really innovates the supply chain and creates cr a, a lot of opportunities for new vendors, incumbents, as well as system uh, integrators to innovate. And we see that as creating new opportunities opportunities for local talent. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, everything we do, we do through a partnership model. And for us, that means local partners. We really focus on identifying companies. Um, you know, I, I've mentioned a few of them in, in Uganda and in Nigeria, we, um, whether it's in the access space or in backhaul or even in, in subsea, we really try to work with local uh, partners in part because we wanna continue investing and developing local talent. And we believe that that's necessary in order to make this ultimately sustainable. All right. No, thanks so much, Alex. Um, uh, you know, we we had a, a mention earlier in the uh, panel discussion about uh, governments and, and regulators uh, insisting on keeping data within country. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, you know, maybe I can pull in um, a guy and, and check. I mean, is, is, do you see this as an opportunity, or is it a threat to uh, you know large scale data centers? How, how do you think of uh, this issue? Well, the, the data sovereignty is the thing that's driving a lot of the data center growth to a certain extent. That's what I mentioned earlier about, you know, Microsoft announcing $2 billion investment in Greece. You know, if they were able to deliver uh, cloud services from, say, Germany, then, you know, it wouldn't really be necessary. I think that there's an issue that every single country wants its uh, sensitive data in country that also creates a legal presence, which also creates a taxation presence and then starts sort of equalizing the whole thing. And that knocks on to local employment. You know, if, if 
if there are no data centers in a country and everything's been fed from abroad, then if you're a young, enthusiastic engineer, your first thought is to leave the country. So all the young, enthusiastic, intelligent people leave. Um, and, and that's a very dangerous thing. So having in, in, internet infrastructure in a country uh, encourages people to stay. So data sovereignty has been, been a generally good thing. Uh, what you don't want is government stepping in a little bit, you know, in terms of regulatory. You know, if a government starts saying 20% uh, of a data center company needs to be owned by local, local uh, residents, then the next thing is, you know, the president's daughter or brother or whatever uh, sits on the board and, 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 and things get, or start getting a bit tricky. So that's not great. You need to encourage uh, external investment because uh, this infrastructure needs, needs billions and billions and billions of dollars over many years. Um, to do that, but data sovereignty does help. It um, it, it just encourages people to, to set up in country, I believe. Well, thanks, Guy and uh, Alex. What would be your take on this? Uh, as a you know, you know, as, as Facebook who has massive data centers, um, hyper uh, scale data centers in a uh, few locations, and now with data sovereignty uh, being asked to open in many other locations, and how do you view it? It's a very complex issue, Abinoff. I think that um, regulators are, are rightly looking at it and there's a lot of attention being paid. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's not one that's going to get settled very easily. Um, there are definitely tensions on both sides in terms of what, what makes sense. What we know is that edge computing and the need for more uh, localized data localization is going to increase, right? Um, no matter whether it's driven by absolute data usage, it's driven by AR, VR technologies. I mean, we've announced that we intend to go to the metaverse, right? We intend to create the metaverse as, as, as Facebook, and it's one that's going to require significant significant uh, additions to edge, to the edge, right? And so uh, we know that there's going to be more localization and data closer to, to users. And uh, we used, we, we are trying to work cooperatively with regulators to find policies that make sense. I, I think if I could just add, Evan, if I think, um, you know, data residency in Africa is, uh, you know, to some extent a double-edged sword. Um, you know, the, the, the data, requirements and the markets, uh, the national markets uh, in Africa, I think in many instances are not big enough to justify, uh, you know, a whole data center being built uh, nationally. And, you know, it, it probably is more efficient, uh, certainly more efficient at this point, for there to be regional data centers and perhaps some kind of regional data sovereignty, um, which, you know, whereby you know, a number of countries are sharing a central uh, data center, because I think that, you know, the, the, the move towards data sovereignty can, can uh, move forward too fast to the, to the point that it will increase the cost of, uh, of data uh, in a country because you're not having to run a whole data center um, to support, you know, relatively small amount of data usage. Well, thanks, Nick. It, it is a complex issue. You're right. It's got it's a double-edged sword. Um, look, we've had a very free, <laughs> free-beating discussion covering multiple things from, you know, empowering communities, to infrastructure sharing, to different technologies, talent, to data sovereignty, uh, and, you know, urban versus rural. Um, and, I, and I've covered all the questions which are coming up, and, you know, we are at that point where we'll run out of time very soon. So maybe what I can do is uh, go around with the panel and just uh, take your closing comments. Um, and maybe Nick, I mean, you have, I have you on the screen. So maybe we start with you. Uh, you know, uh, what would you like to share around how do you see this industry and what are things we should really watch for? Well, I think the biggest challenge for all of us is that we get the uptake uh, that uh, we need and that uh, Africa needs. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest risk is that, you know, we all want to build infrastructure, yet um, it's not sufficiently utilized and uptake remains low. And, you know, I think even if you look at mobile networks, in rolling out 4G, we're talking about 5G, yet there's many 4G networks where uptake is, uh, is, is low. They're not running at full capacity. So I think you know the the issue of affordability and relevance 
and, and making sure that the products are relevant to the market um, is, is enormously important. Um, no use just bringing in more capital and um, you know, uh, building more infrastructure if uh, people are not able to make use of it and we're not delivering uh, cost-effective solutions that people are making use of. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, Stephen, your thoughts, your closing remarks? Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd echo that actually, what Nick was saying. I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenally exciting environment with an, uh, with an amazing opportunity with demographics that would support um, a huge opportunity for, for investors. Um, affordability is key and, you know, it's, a, it's, it's circular. You, you need to give that affordability so people can, can make use and, and become more digitally aware, which creates wealth and, and you, you, you get on the right car, the curve. But um, uh, very exciting and, and, and that's the challenge, I think. Well, thanks so much, Stephen. Guy, um, how do you view the next few years in, in digital infrastructure? I think, you know, who, who knows what the next uh, few years will, will bring, you know, who knows what, what, what's going to happen next. We didn't think COVID was going to happen, you know, all sorts of other things might happen. But if we assume that things are going the way they're going now, then the next 10 years is an amazing period for sub-Saharan Africa. And I think we have to somehow connect the enormous enthusiasm of young people in Africa, as Nick mentioned, um, with the enthusiasm of uh, private equity, which is really sort of um, stuck a big map of, map of sub-Saharan Africa in every uh, PE funds uh, partners offices now. So money is coming in, uh, it's got to be matched with enthusiastic, smart people, and then we'll really make something of this. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Guy. Um, Alex, closing remarks? Sure. I, what I would say is we know that the challenges are very complex. And so addressing the connectivity barriers in Africa is going to require a truly multifaceted approach, right? We have to talk about international subsea to Africa, which we've launched is going to be about 43,000 kilometers of subsea cables on landing and over 30 uh, different areas in Africa will help that. Uh, we have to talk about pairing and core, right? Well, Guy's been talking about data centers. Obviously, private equity is rushing into just those top tier metros, but what about all the other metros with over a million people that Guy mentioned, right? So we're going to have to figure out a way to do that as well. Um, we talked about backbone and backhaul, and, and Liquid is, is definitely an innovator in that space and has really done amazing things already and, and is building the east-west corridor, which we're, we're happy to support. Uh, we're going to have to talk about access. Access, right? We're going to have to talk about tower sharing and infrastructure sharing. And we also have to talk about technology innovation. And so we're happy to continue to support uh, the TIP ecosystem, uh, not only in the access area in terms of open RAN, but also in terms of disaggregated networks, in terms of transport. So it really, it's a complex issue. And so addressing each of those pieces is going to require a truly multifaceted approach and a partnership model. We can't do it alone. We have to do it together. And we really want to support and encourage infrastructure sharing as in a way to promote um, addressing these connectivity barriers. Thank you so much, uh, Alex. And, and thank you to, to all the panelists. This was a really, really interesting discussion. Uh, I think we could all agree that uh, digital infrastructure continues to be a really exciting space in, in Africa. Uh, and it's got these multiple issues to, to explore, lots of compromises that we need to uh, sort of address and, and break. Uh, and our panelists came up with uh, quite a few of these important areas that we will continue to, to develop and, and talk about uh, in the future. So thank you everyone. With that, I will close the panel uh, and thanks to, to all our listeners as well. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.